Hello, and welcome to Crew Call, the Below the Line podcast by, for, and about the crew. Welcome, Ken Petrie from the UK. All the way from the UK speaking with us. It's awesome to have you with us. Um, and you are a special effects technician. So, for my very first question for everybody listening, many people are going to confuse special effects with visual effects. So, can you give us um, the definition of both or what the difference is? Yeah, well, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, they're, they're quite different in actual fact. Special effects is typically physical in-camera effects that we create on set and do you know, live in-camera. And visual effects generally covers digital augmentation, you know, crowd replications, wire removal, digital explosions, you know, computers versus real life, basically. Visual effects are generally computers. Special effects are generally on set where the danger is. <laughs> so you're working with the stunt people too, right? We do. We work very closely with the stunt guys and obviously make sure that everything's safe for them because, you know, even though their job is taking the hard hits, we've got to make sure it's spectacular but safe because, you know, they're, right. they're valuable too. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to burn them up or anything. <laughs> no, no. So no, but when they're usually nice to us because they because <laughs> they know we've got some toys. Ah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. generally, stunt people are actually the the coolest on set. They are. Um, yeah, they are pretty cool. They're yeah. pretty laid back and and a lot of fun. Yeah. No, they're usually lovely guys. Um, and they are and girls and yes. uh, yeah, they're a lot of fun to work with. So, as a special effects technician, when did you get started in the business? Uh, I got started uh, probably about ten years ago, and kind of came through uh, live events, you know, theater and rock and roll type stuff where oh. I did quite a lot of pyrotechnics. And then I kind of got an opportunity with an effects company in the UK to round out my skills and move into the film industry a bit more. Um, so I got my break with a company that uh, sort of BBC approved. So over in the UK, we would do all the kind of BBC shows and all, all that kind of stuff. And that's where I really built and rounded out my skill set. So, oh, nice. And what was your first uh, show or movie? God, my first movie as an effects guy was a, a film called Stone of Destiny. Uh, I mean, I did one before that called Outpost, which is a Nazi zombie horror movie. <laughs> but that was kind of work experience. And I guess ultimately that landed me the job uh, with this company full time. And it was Stone of Destiny, which was directed by Charles Martin Smith. Uh, um, a few of you might know um, so you know from like the untouchables and stuff like that so uh, yeah that was quite interesting and yeah it was a steep learning curve you know you sort of you're always learning but the first few days the first few weeks and months yeah it's a lot of equipment and a lot of terminology and a lot of everything to get to grips with so it's good did you ever work in any other department first or even like while you were doing that got into a different department? Yeah, no, it was it's pretty direct into special effects. I think because uh, I had a skill set in pyrotechnics okay. and, you know, specifically for live events and stuff, they're quite transferable into the film industry to then learn those ropes because uh, it obviously gets a lot bigger and a lot more complex, some of the explosive stuff we do in films. Um, but, yeah, it was straight into effects and... It's just, what an interesting department, you know. It's there's never a dull moment. So, yeah, it was it was definitely where I wanted to be. So, well, what are some of the other effects that you do besides pyro? So, special effects uh, we cover obviously pyrotechnics, but also fire, wind, rain, snow, uh, any sort of element like that. Smoke. Uh, you know, sometimes we're involved in the the fabrication of big rigs that can flip people or fly people or crash vehicles or you know again working in collaboration with the stunt department we'll help them you know design and build uh you know stunts and, and effects like that so we're all you know we all work close together basically anything destructive or dangerous or that does something pretty cool pretty elaborate we're probably involved somewhere a boy's dream right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. But there's a lot of intelligent people, you know, there's a lot of guys that come into my department from engineering backgrounds where, you know, structurally safe stuff and, 
you know, there's some very, very intelligent people that work for some of the biggest supervisors. And they're fun to work with because, you know, you look at effects sometimes and think, how are we going to do that? And these guys come up with incredible ways and discreet and safe ways, you know, which is obviously part of the remit as well. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's always a challenge and it's lots of fun um, and great to see it on screen. Don't yeah. think anything quite beats that feeling of seeing your stuff on screen. I know exactly when it's actual real stuff and not and not the computer generated stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people are coming back to physical effects because we can do them pretty cost effectively and create a great result right. and get it in camera. You know, and there's something organic and authentic about that. And what's and, uh, and what's nice about that too is then then you got more more people working and more stunt people working as well yeah absolutely it keeps um you know it keeps the ecosystem going and and it and it's great i mean one of the interesting things about effects i think in general which is what i a conversation i had with a a a supervisor i sometimes work with is that we're probably one of the only departments that performs live on screen without being on screen talent you know like props are generally set you know hair and makeup's generally done you could say the grips and the camera operators, I guess, but, you know, lighting set, whereas, you know, we've got to know when to push a button to fire the pyro or we've got to know, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's kind of, it's quite an interactive department, um, but it's cool. That's, that's a buzz, you know, you've got to nail it. If you want to operate at the highest end of the industry, you have to know when not to push the button as well as when to push the button. So, you know, and be, and be accountable for that. So walk us through a typical day. If there is one for a special effects technician. A, a typical day it can be anything. It really depends on what effects we're doing. But quite often it starts with a pre-call using expensive equipment or sensitive equipment or dangerous products. They obviously have to be kept in secure and safe locations. So pre-calls are usually making sure you're ready to go when you know camera's on set at 8 a.m. or whatever and you're good to go you know you never want to be waiting for the effects guys is always a motto that a guy I used to work for said and <laughs> so so you spend your pre-call getting ready and then yeah you just kind of you try and get ahead of everything so that you've got the next couple of things ready or or get a step ahead so that when the DOP says actually can we have a blood splat over there you know all the bits and pieces to do that are in the floor bag or they're nearby because you know sometimes Effects guys get a bad deal with where the trucks park. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> we, uh, we're parked a long way away, and that equipment is heavy, I'm telling you. So sometimes it can be a bit awkward to, to get stuff quickly. But, so you just try and you know, stay ahead and, and speak to you know, the HODs and make sure you're ready and, and people are, you know, everybody's working together. That, you know, that's what's fun about it is when everybody's collaborating and, and we're all on the same team at the end of the day, trying to make the same thing look great. So... Um, and then the day can just take a variety of turns or they need more of something or less of something, or we're going to tweak things. And, you know, it's, it, you just have to be again on your toes, ready to adapt, but, but that's, what's fun. So I guess the short answer there is, is there isn't a, a typical day. Then I would think that d- depending on what special effect you're doing, there's going to be a, a different prep time for each type of job that you're doing. Yeah, right. Or do you primarily get, like, do they make you, do they only give you a set amount of time or is that something that you guys set? Yeah, generally we know what sort of effects people are looking for. You know, if you take a if you take a studio picture, for example, we get, you know, generally get a bit of lead time on them. Uh, because if it's a complex film, obviously there might be rigs that need to be built and tested and integrated into sets and all that kind of stuff. And I've done a few jobs where, I, again, I kind of am more involved on the pyrotechnic side, and we've got to make sure that you know fake walls built in sets behave how you would think a bullet ricochets into a, into a wall. You know, you've got to make sure that the look is right and things break or explode or behave how how they should, you know, and how the director wants. Which sometimes historical accuracy isn't the same as director's vision. I I did a I did a show once where. I did uh, close to 100 tests on one particular effect. Uh, we showed up on day one, shooting day one, which was when we were doing the effect. And 
we provided the effect, which I thought had been signed off. And uh, turns out the director hadn't watched any of the tests. Oh, no. So whatever feedback I was given was um, hadn't come from him. So, uh, you know, that, that's an awkward moment when the rest of the crew thinks, God, these guys didn't bring their A game on day one. They're in for a long ride on a 116-day shoot. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, we, we got there and he got what he wanted because we adapted and, you know, had the, the team and the, and the resources to give him what he wanted. But that's great because it was a studio picture. So there's a bit more time and a bit more resources. Sometimes the lower budget pictures or the, or the television stuff, you know, there's not as much lead time. I did a show on Monday um, just doing some rain for a show called Mr. Selfridge, which I think you guys have on PBS um, with Jeremy Piven. And that was a rain setup. So we just showed up and, you know, did, did the rain. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, dress it to camera. You know, there's no prep time on that because it's quite a simple effect. Tell us a little bit about the structure of the special effects department and who reports to whom and how does that all work? So there'll be a special effects supervisor. Um, the terminology is sometimes a little bit different in North America and the UK. Uh, I would call the boss boss a special effects supervisor. Sometimes in North America, he's called a special effects coordinator. But there's somebody at the okay. top. And then sort of working as their office support in the UK, we would have a special effects coordinator, <laughs> which is where it gets complicated because... That's the other person in America. But basically, there's a guy or a girl at the top, and then there's an office coordinator that, that does all the management of the team. And then the supervisor will bring on a floor supervisor who will run main unit effects, probably a second unit floor supervisor who will obviously run second unit, and a prep supervisor who will run prep. Uh, and then usually a workshop supervisor who runs building mechanisms, etc. Uh, and then sometimes a pyrotechnic supervisor as well. So there'll be then, you know, somewhere in the region of three to five kind of sub-level supervisors, which each then run each strand. Um, again, this is talking on some of the biggest shows, you know, where we have 50, 60, 100 people on, on the team. And then oh, nice. each supervisor then, if we take the floor on set, the floor supervisor runs it, liaises with the first AD and the director and stands beside camera with their radio and their pointing finger and they make sure that, <laughs> make sure that the right effects happen at the right time. Um, and under them, there'll be some senior special effects technicians who are generally really experienced guys that, you know, have probably at least 15 years experience. And, you know, they know the score as well. Then under them, there'll be special effects technicians uh, like myself, that's really where the bulk of the special effects department is, is in the special effects technicians who, you know, do all the, all the real day-to-day -day effects. Uh, and then the, the senior guys will take, leads on, take the lead on some effects. And then underneath that, we'll have special effects assistants who are just, they, they're in that transition phase. They're just about ready to be technicians. And they're getting, so they've got a bit more responsibility, but they're not quite technicians yet. And underneath them, we've got trainees who, you know, the trainees are in their first sort of five years of the industry and, and learning the ropes and hopefully making a good cup of tea and, you know, all, all <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, so there's really like five, five tiers, trainees, assistant technicians, technicians, senior technicians, and then floor supervisors and kind of supervisory stuff. So it's a, it's a large department. It can a lot of our stuff is quite big scale, especially on you know big TV stuff or studio stuff. It's to like a Wolfman. I think we had thirty five guys putting smoke into into a forest because you got to get oh. that volume of atmosphere and and eeriness and all that kind of stuff. It's it's a bit it's a big setup. So, but then sometimes you go and just it might just be two of you doing a little intimate effect or whatever. It just it really it really varies, but. Generally, on the big stuff, they're quite big departments. And then you have all the guys back in the workshop as well. So you have the workshop technicians and the senior technicians there and the trainees in the workshop who are, you know, fabricating rigs and, and doing lots of clever stuff and designing things. So what is um, the most difficult thing to do? I think the most. this is going to sound a little bit, probably not what you expect, but I think the hardest bit is usually the really small incidental effects 
because uh, generally if it's medium or big or you know people know it's happening there's lead time there's prep there's everybody's aware that today's a big effects day on set that you know those cars are going to blow up or that truck's going to flip or you know whatever but i think when you just try and do the little squirt of water or the little the picture falling off the wall um you know that that stuff can just drive you insane because you know if it doesn't happen on take one or take two then you've got floor supervisors senior technicians technicians everybody's got an opinion by that point because you thought it was going to be really easy and it's not worked and you just think (laughs) come on guys let's let's make this happen (laughs) you know so the big stuff everybody's thought about and planned and tested it sometimes uh when the director goes can you guys just do that and you think yeah yeah no problem and then it just doesn't quite work as well uh, quite as simply as you think and language barriers like i did a show in morocco at the end of last year that there were there was a moment where people didn't seem to understand that the pretty small things that were in front of me were going to create an absolutely massive explosion um and moroccan children are let's call them rascals they uh, they like they like to go and look at things you're trying to protect people you know because it can be a dangerous environment especially if people don't know what's happening but um so so language barriers and the really incidental easy in the inverted commas stuff um everything else you know people people respect the big stuff sometimes they don't respect the small stuff so how how much stuff do you have to make like if you have to keep on doing something over and over again where something breaks how many things do you have to actually have as backup um it it varies on a case-by-case basis but generally we we'd normally look to have three takes of everything uh so like if i'm squibbing a costume uh, I'll have, I'll, well, I, in an ideal world, I'll have three versions of that costume. Uh, so when you think about it, the um, the film has to buy six, maybe, you know, maybe seven, eight. By the time stunts have got one, I've got three, there's a, cu- there's a hero, there's a couple of backups, you know. And again, I've been on shows where they've had to give the effects department costume trailers because we had to squib, 86 guys over the course of the film you know as featured people that were being shot so i've given myself a really difficult number 86 but 86 (laughs) times three you know is 264 i think and it's you know that's a lot of costumes when they've got when you need to hang them up somewhere and you've got to put an average of four squibs on each of them you know you're looking at over a thousand squibs so it's a time consuming and expensive thing to do uh so generally three, but it, it depends. And sometimes you can only do it once, you know. Uh, this supervisor I talk about, Neil Corbold, his brother, Chris Corbold, uh, who won his Oscar for Inception, um, he has done the recent Bond films and the recent Batman films. And, you know, when, uh, when they blew up that building because the Joker was uh, walking away, you know, Heath Ledger was pushing the button on that hospital that blew up. They had one shot at that, you know that's a real building doing that. And, you know, uh, some really, really clever and talented explosives engineers that we, we work quite closely with came in and helped the guys. Uh, I was, I wasn't on that show, but you know, the stories that I told those guys, you know, they're prepping that thing, making sure that it's safe for Heath and safe for the crew. And, you know, they've got one shot at it, but it's a killer shot, right? I mean, it, right. You know, it's an, it's an epic setup, but there wasn't another building around the corner. <laughs> they could yeah, so I wonder use, if something yeah. does go wrong. Like, what would they do in that instance? Uh, I, th- I think that's a question for your producer and your director. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you can go away and come back. You know, it, it might be a two-hour reset. Uh, sometimes they wait for that reset. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes you'll reschedule it and come back. Uh, I've had that once on a show where we came back the next week and try it again. Um, and yeah, I mean, you just have to, you've got to adapt, right? But yeah. again, ultimately you're trying to get the, get the director and the other creatives at the top of that tree, exactly what they want. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's why they get the Neil and Chris Corbels and, you know, Trevor Woods and all, you know, all these, there's a whole list of great British special effects guys and, and Americans and Canadians as we worked with in Canada you know, and that's why these guys are at the top of their game because they deliver these effects, you know, safely and on time 
and in one take as required. So that's why the big guys keep getting the big shows. You know, that's that's right. how the Hollywood world works, right? So exactly. Now here's a question from a listener. Her name is Jess. Um, she asks, "You've worked on some massive productions like World War Z, but you've also worked on shows that aren't all bombs and car chases, like Call the Midwife." On episodes, yeah. projects like that, what would your job entail? Um, yeah, so Call the Midwife, I don't know if you guys have that in the States, but it's a period drama set around midwives, funnily enough. And okay. so there's there's a lot more atmospheric stuff, you know, smoke or little fire jobs and things like that. But the last one I did on Call the Midwife was uh, a breakaway floor. So there's a surveyor in a, you know, pretty run-down building and the the floorboards are a bit creaky where he is and he falls through it so we built this trapdoor rig so the the actor to get the hero shots and the uh, you know the close-ups could stand on it perfectly safely whilst the surrounding bit around him was all breakaway mm. and then we swap in the stunt guy and you know get the long shots or whatever or get you know from slightly further away and, and all that kind of stuff um, and he's standing on the trapdoor, but again, he could jump up and down on that trapdoor. It was perfectly safe. And then it's on a, a what we call a bomb release, which is an electrical method of releasing a latch, basically. Uh, you know, three, two, one, bang. And the floor drops away and all the breakaway stuff around it and all the dust that we've kind of sprinkled in so it looks old and, you know, dramatic. And, and he'll fall down and, and make it look great. So... You know, I think that was one of the biggest things they've done recently, but quite often those kind of shows are rain or smoke or little practical fires and, and things like that. But that was quite an interesting one for them. And, and it looked great. Um, and in actual fact, it needed a little bit of visual effects to just tidy up some of the rig because of the to keep the structural integrity of the floor that we had to break away from them. There was certain metal built into it. And, you know, that's that's a good example of visual effects and special effects working together, tools in the toolbox to create the best effect. So now do you interact with the cast much? Yeah, I mean, obviously you've got to respect that they're doing their job as well and they are uh, they need their space sometimes if they need to get into an emotional place or, you know, so it, it really varies. Some cast are quite quiet or insular, it's sort of in the zone and others can just switch it on and off. Uh, so the the guys and girls that switch it on and off, they're quite good fun because, well, you know, we're working quite closely with, like we said, stunts and then uh, the the main cast. When we're doing effects or we're doing dangerous stuff or squibs or, you know, kind of the weapony type stuff or, or uh -huh. vehicle stuff. So, yeah, you interact with them in a professional capacity. And then there's some who want to interact in a more jovial or social capacity. So, yeah, uh, they can be a lot of fun. I think um, one of the people I really enjoyed working with recently was Channing Tatum. Um, the guy is able to just get into the role, uh, but also able to have a lot of fun. And he's just one of the nicest guys, you know. In terms of his professional ability, he takes it all in his stride and really has to be, you know, told that he's not allowed to do things. He'll never, well, my experience was, you know, he wants to do it all. Um, and he, as a, as a pyro guy, um, Channing hits his mark every time. He says he's going to put his left foot there. He puts his left foot there. He says he's going to do it at that pace. He does it at that pace. And that, you know, doesn't always happen. And that's a real pleasure to work with. And then on the flip side, the camera cuts and we have this, you know, have this banter. He was, you know, he was, he was great. Everybody he was just, it was a really nice environment. Well, the, th the thing about him, he's a dancer. So that's why he yeah. probably has really good timing and yeah. he knows choreography. So, of course, that's why he's going to be good for you as far as hitting the mark every single time because as a dancer, you have to hit your mark. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's just a pleasure to work with people like that. And then, like I said, when the cameras stopped rolling, it was a lot of fun. There's, um, there's another effects technician, a guy. Here you are, Chris Mochiradi. Here's a shout out to you, Chris. I can still spell your name as well. I wrote it on so many timesheets. Um, no, Chris is a good pal. And um, we were on the show together with Channing. And now Chris has hair a bit like um, Sideshow Bob. You know, kind of <laughs> like, kind of like short dreads. You know, kind of yeah. cool. You know, he's got a cool look. 
And I don't know what, I don't know what Channing, I don't know where it came from, but he really wanted to shave Chris's hair into like a <laughs> mohawk. Like, <laughs> like, like a, imagine Sideshow Bob with a mohawk. It's just the most crazy thing. So, so this, we had this great, um, this great fun for like maybe a week or 10 days of negotiating a deal of, you know, basically Channing offered him some money to let him shave it. And, uh, <laughs> And it, it was it was a number that most people would say yes instantly. But he uh, he said no. He's like, you know, I've had these 10 years. I'm not going to shave them off. <laughs> and anyway, this Chris and I and Channing had this conversation for like 10 days trying to negotiate this deal. And I'm like, no, nah, he's got to get more. You've got to give him more, Chan. And then, you know, you've got to throw a party for the crew as well. And then Chris might do it. And, you know, <laughs> anyway. Anyway, they were literally about to shake hands. And I said... Yeah, pound sterling. Remember, we're British. This is pound sterling. No, no, no. I thought you meant Canadian dollars. No way. No way. Hey, I'd stretch to US dollars. I'm like, well, deal's off, Channing. Come on, you've got to, you've got to stump up this cash. And uh, <laughs> anyway, he, uh, he went and asked Roland Emmerich for the other half. And, uh, and, and he was like, yeah, cool, whatever. He was just, you know, in his kind of chilled out way. So on Channing's last day on set, uh, eight o'clock on the Sunday morning after we'd finished uh, you know, a Saturday shoot. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, Chani said thank you to everybody, and then out came the chair, out came the clippers. Chris sat down, got on FaceTime with his sister, and Chani shaved his head into a mohawk, and <laughs> you know, gave him pulled out this cash, you know, gave him it, you know, all in good fun, good sport. The the crew and cast were just in hysterics, you know, it was it was hilarious and just what we needed after quite a busy week. And you know what? Chris looked even better with the mohawk. Like, no way. So I'm sure he still owes me a drink for helping him get quite a bit of cash out of it. But uh, yeah, no, it's cool. It was, you know, a bit of fun. And, and it's nice when you can, you know, when everybody's, when people are real people, it's nice. You know? Yeah. So it yeah. was a lot of fun. Have you ever let any of the actors trigger any special effect? Or is that all you guys do that? But I would assume, aren't there some things that they would have to, like the stunt guys would have to do? Yeah, I think I think stunt guys are in a different bracket probably from from actors. Again, you know, a lot of actors are more than capable of doing their own stunts, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes, I remember doing some tests with uh, with some people, and we we let them use a self fire button. To fire some squibs, just uh, this was sort of in when wireless technology was kind of in its infancy, um, and or certainly the industry didn't trust wirelessly firing pyrotechnics at that time, um, and we let this particular actor fire them themselves, and we hadn't even turned over and they'd fired it. So we sort of learned quite quickly that let us be in control okay. of it because again, sometimes you want to be able to not push that button as well as push it, um, but stunt guys quite often. It's in particular, car stuff, if they're flipping and things, if it's nitrogen and stuff, um, they'll probably push their own button because they know if they're on the right mark or the right line. Or Yeah, that's I, I kind of thought that because in some of those instances, they, only they are in control. Yeah, but generally we try and keep it, the effects department try and keep control because, you know, we're the guys that have maybe done that thing before or right. we've got a different viewpoint and angle we can see something or or we get you know it comes over the radio that it shouldn't happen for whatever reason so you know so since the time you started out has the industry changed at all yeah i mean it must have changed uh, but i think it's probably gradual change and so i can't put my finger on anything that's massively changed i mean of course we went through a phase around about die another day kind of time where People went to visual effects because computers were the, apparently they were the answer. Um, and I think there's probably a few years of films that could have had better effects in them. But that was a new technology and that was exciting. And people thought that was 100% the future. And right. there was certainly a time where people were like, yeah, models are dead or, you know, certain physical effects will just die out now. But people have really come back to it because I think audiences can tell you know, and I, I, that's not that's nothing to do with the quality of the visual effects. I think there's just something. There's just there's just that 
X that X factor that people um, just tell. And um, real in-camera effects look dangerous, they feel dangerous, or the models behave incredibly well. And um, not not good looking models. I mean, like my scale models. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, you know that stuff's an art in itself as well. You know, there's guys that you bring in specifically to do models because they did it. Like the the heroes, the guys that got us all interested in it, like Derek Meddings and stuff, and you know those guys that did Thunderbirds and all that kind of stuff. It's that's cool. That's real old school in camera effects that people are doing to an incredibly high standard, and that's cool. That's what gets you interested. So, lastly, if you were king of Hollywood. What would you do differently? Um, God, a king of... That's a really good question. I think you've got to make sure people get credit for the work they do. Everybody, or generally, works really very hard on projects, on productions. And again, like coming back to the unsung heroes of the you know, PAs or you know, the extras hair and makeup or whatever, people, like to people that aren't in the industry those films or those television shows or those credits, that's, that's our currency. That's what we trade on. Like your great auntie doesn't know what a dolly grip does. And she thinks, Oh, you're a dolly grip. I've no idea what that is. I've no Mm. idea where you go, what you do, but you worked on mission impossible. I get that. That's the bit they get. They go mission impossible. And I think so, you know, when you see the credits roll by and your name's not there, like, if you've worked hard on that show, that's really, I think that's really unfair. Like, sometimes yeah. it's an oversight, but sometimes it's political. And I just, you know, people, that's what people trade on. That's, that's their currency to the wider world. Yeah. Um, and maybe a casting crew invite. <laughs> you know, yeah. Nice to go and see the film. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I think the, um, the world, our world, the entertainment world, Hollywood, mm-hmm the movie and television industry um, is its own beast and I don't know I think as long as you're having fun you know and you want to be there it's a great place to be I think when you stop having fun you got to get out because it's punishing so uh, it's great and yeah but you got to have fun you got to have fun and we've had a lot of fun with you Ken Petrie from the UK thank you so much for joining us hey thanks for having me oh gosh it was a pleasure and um, yeah thanks so much yeah great no thanks for having me and that's all for this week's crew call thanks again to Ken for reaching across the pond to tell us a bit about special effects tune in next time for a discussion about script coordinating with Eddie Quintana If you'd like to support Crew Call, remember to click the Amazon link on the Tapa website before you go shopping. It doesn't cost you anything, and Amazon gives us a little kickback. Everyone wins.